Good evening. Uh, my name is Julia Fraser and I'm the Associate Director of AsiaLink. I'd like to welcome members of the AsiaLink board here tonight, Consuls General, distinguished guests, and thank you for coming out on such a cold winter's night. I can assure you that by the end of the night, it'll be very warm in here, judging from the discussions that we've already had upstairs with our panelists. Um, tonight, it's an absolute feast. Uh, we have with you tonight, let me introduce you just briefly, just to show you who we have here tonight. We have uh, Dr. Dale Jajanwin from the Third World Network. We have Dr. Malta Meinhausen, Senior Honorary Visiting Researcher, School of Earth Sciences at the University of Melbourne. We have the wonderful Professor John Daly, CEO of the Grattan Institute. And we also have Kirsty Allen here, who has stepped in for Anna Rose, who unfortunately wasn't uh, able to come. She became quite ill, as a lot of people are in this winter, uh, midst of winter. We're very delighted also that we have, um, getting this uh, debate together, um, Jim Middleton, who many of you know. Um, Jim Middleton is the Australia Network's chief current affairs anchor and has been so since 2008. And he's also been the chief presenter of Australia's Network's Asia Pacific Focus Program, amongst many other accomplishments. This panel tonight is ready to go. We thought that having a full house almost tonight wasn't enough for such a, a, a very important event. We've also got an online component happening as we speak. But let me tell you a little bit about why we're all here tonight and the series. This event is co-hosted by AsiaLink, the Confucius Institute, and my dear colleague, uh, Julia Gong. Where's Julia? Julia Gong, there. Uh, this, we have a Julia and Julia show here. Uh, Julia Gong uh, will close the evening. Uh, she is the director of the Confucius Institute here at the University of Melbourne. We have uh, the Melbourne Energy Institute, such a dynamic group of people. The officers of the Deputy Vice Chancellor Engagement at the University of Melbourne who are running this very innovative program called Australia's Role in the World. And it's innovative in a, in a whole lot of ways, but mainly because we're delighted that this is, apart from the University of Melbourne and the Australian Institute of International Affairs, we have Voices of the Next Generation and the UN Youth Australia, um, very important to keep going. This series aims to promote debate on global issues such as this and Australia's role in international affairs. So as I was saying, uh, we decided to take this online and we've invited um, Timothy Van Gelden, Gelder from yourview.com.org, whatever. We're, yeah, he'll be here. He'll explain to you how you can do it, uh, get online and, and, uh, and participate in the debate as we're speaking and how the rest of of the world can do it as they're hearing the debate. So over to you, Timothy. Uh, thanks, Julia. Uh, Your View Australia is a platform for discerning the wisdom of the crowd. And for current purposes, we are a crowd. Uh, we're a somewhat more educated crowd than some crowds, uh, but uh, that's, that's helpful, in fact. Uh, now, as you may know, th that the, under the right circumstances, the crowd can be, and I say this with the greatest respect to the panellists tonight, <laughs> the crowd can be more reliable than any particular individual. That's what we'd like to try to test tonight, by opening up the issues, f at least one a core issue in this forum, to us. Uh, the crowd. Uh, we'll do this with the platform, your view. Uh, we need a platform because the wisdom of the crowd can be difficult to identify. That's why we don't often know it as often as we should. Uh, I'll give just the briefest introduction to, um, to the, 
to how to use the platform. You can see it obviously up on the screen here. This is the front page. Uh, you can log in at yourview.org.au or yrvw.org. Um, just click through right at the top here to tonight's issue, China leads the world in the fight against global warming. That is obviously a controversial topic. Uh, this has been available, this has been up for a number of days, and so there's already some participation, and we can see a divergence of viewpoints. Uh, if I've clicked, having clicked through this page, you'll see a brief introduction to the issue, and then an area where you can add your vote and your comment. But before you do that, you might like to scroll a little further down and see some of the viewpoints which have already been expressed. On a mobile phone, it might help if you click on the one column for a uh, more compact layout. In order to vote, you do need to be signed in, but that's a fairly painless process. I'll click here to sign in because you can, click, you can sign in with your Facebook, Twitter, or Google accounts. I'll sign in right now with my Twitter account, and that will take me straight through, because I'm already logged into Twitter, uh, to, uh, to the issue, and I can proceed to vote and express my comment uh, and, and, uh, and debate with others, re reply and so forth, and rate comments. Now, there's a results area here. Uh, this is the current results. This is the prelimi preliminary results. You can see on a raw vote basis, 39% have supported the proposition that China <laughs> leads the world. The collective wisdom, on the other hand, is slightly different. Uh, it says that 66% uh, actually oppose this view. Uh, and this, in a sense, is the point of a platform like this. It tries to identify the difference between the raw vote and the wisdom of us as a crowd. I don't have time now to explain how that works. There is information on the site about that. But it should be fairly straightforward to use, uh, and I'll leave it there. So I'll just add that this will be available during the session, but also for a week afterwards. So you can express your view on the site after the event. All clear, I'm sure. Thank you very much, Tim. Well, hello and welcome to uh, this uh, wonderful event. A very, very fine roll-up, as Julia has noted, for a very cold winter evening. Nothing like climate change to get everyone well and truly warmed up. So here we are in uh, 2012. Australia is now much further from consensus on the subject of climate change than it was even in the lead up to the uh, Copenhagen summit in 2009. The US has slipped backwards, if anything, in terms of its commitments of, uh, to action. And China is uh, an even bigger player and even more important and even more crucial to whatever uh, is or is not done uh, than it was even back at the time of Copenhagen in, in 2009. So, it is entirely appropriate that in a series uh, called uh, Australia's Role in the World that this evening we should be gathered to discuss China, climate change and sustainability. And uh, to lead us off in a moment or two, we're very, very fortunate in to do, indeed to have with us uh, Jia Jun Wen, uh, who has uh, had considerable experience in dealing with these matters over the past few years not only in her role with the Third World Network, but elsewhere as well. Dr Wen has uh, focused on sustainable development issues for more than a decade. She received her PhD at Caltech and has worked closely with organisations such as the Third World Network. Over the past few years, Dr Wen has followed the international climate negotiations very closely and has substantial insights into the Chinese government's reasoning and policy making as well as to what is happening on the ground. So in a moment or two we'll hear from her about exactly what is going on as far as China is concerned and what its view of the way in which the action or lack of it is unfolding 
uh, globally as well uh, what the view from Beijing is. Once she has spoken, we've got a very fine panel to uh, add value to what has come before. Uh, to my immediate uh, right is uh, Kirsty Albion, who is campaign manager uh, for the Australian Youth Climate Coalition. And uh, so, quite clearly, we'll have a fairly interesting Australian perspective on what uh, has followed. Kirsty uh, is uh, also a team manager with Project Survival Pacific and uh, has been involved in many of uh, environmental education programs, including the Youth Climate Coalition Switched On Schools, uh, Parks and uh, Wildlife's Discovery Program, and the Melbourne Museum School Holidays Program, among others. We're very pleased to have uh, her here uh, tonight. Uh, sitting next to Kirsty, uh, Professor John Daly, who's the CEO of the, of the Grattan Institute, a very fine and extremely uh, erudite uh, think tank based here uh, in Melbourne. Uh, Professor Daly has uh, fully two decades of uh, experience working in uh, in, in policy, academic, government and corporate roles, not just here at the University of Melbourne but at Oxford University, in government, at the Victorian Department of Justice and with McKinsey's uh, and also with uh, the ANZ Bank. Law and Economics, uh, the Professor's uh, specialities and he's lectured, uh, I see, on subjects as diverse as the constitutional provisions of economic union, I'm not sure whether we've got one of those in Australia at the moment. The policy of civil procedure and the rule of law. So uh, John uh, will be uh, looking forward to hearing from you. Next to John, Dr Malta Meinshausen, who is Honorary Fellow uh, and Honorary Research Fellow at the School of Earth Sciences here at the University of Melbourne and uh, Senior Researcher also at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research in Germany. Uh, he was a contributing author to uh, some of the chapters in the fourth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, he's uh, been a consultant in various capacities going back to 2000, 2000 and up to 2005 provided advice to various non-government organisations on climate science and in the international climate negotiations and since 2005 he's been an advisor to the German Environment Ministry uh, on climate change negotiations. So we can expect to have a very interesting insight from a European's perspective after we've heard from Dr Wen on the Chinese perspective and I expect that will be uh, a very interesting interchange uh, indeed. And uh, so that's the panel. Here is our speaker. Dr Wen, if you would watch your way carefully around the front here, uh, we'll have you on board to, uh, to talk about uh, climate change, China, climate change, sustainability, spin, facts and realpolitik. Dr Dale Wen. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, hello everyone, it's very honored to be here and uh, first I want to say I'm not only speaking from a Chinese perspective, I'm speaking from a perspective as a Chinese citizen as well as a global citizen because for the last uh, 20 years uh, I have lived uh, in United States and Europe. I ha have really lived uh, in different cultures and uh, so you probably would find I'm not a typical Chinese. Uh, typical Chinese would be more moderate. Well, I'm very outspoken in the typical Western fashion. <laughs> so I will start with a question. Uh, a question I was asked uh, right before Copenhagen by a senior Chinese energy official. And his question is, how serious is the West about climate change? He said, we are having blackouts in some places in order to make the energy conservation targets. Is any Annex One country is having comparable measures in order to reach their Kyoto targets? Uh, to be honest, I was really 
jolted by this question because from an environmental point of view, I have always argued that China needs to do more. That's what I continue to do domestically. But on the other hand, this question really confronted me and I have been trying to search for a good answer for that. Because in order to, for us to push China to do more domestically, this is the answer I personally feel like I cannot, a question I cannot avoid answering. But unfortunately, it's hard to find a good answer for that. It's not only that China's domestic actions are not being acknowledged, which the domestic actions I will talk about, but it's, China was blamed big time for the failure in Copenhagen, the collapse of the talks during Copenhagen. So for example, Mark Ninas, a British journalist who was paid by the EU to be on the Maldives delegation wrote a very damaging piece called How Do I Know China Wrecked the Copenhagen Deal? I was in the room. This, this article was probably the most read English report about Copenhagen, as both worldwide as well as in China. So his diagnosis is that to those who blame Obama and rich countries in general know this. It was China's representative who insisted that industrialized country target previously agreed as a 80% cut by 2050 be taken out of the deal. So that was China's big thing for sinking Copenhagen. So what really happened? Yes, it's true. China rejected these numbers. So it was during Copenhagen, the Western countries led by Germany proposed a long-term goal, a 2050 goal, of reducing global emissions by 50% by year 2020, while 80% for developed countries. So it sounds good, right? It's meaning the developed countries are taking the lead to cut emissions, but unfortunately, this is not true when you really do the math. So Martin Cole, the director of South Center, actually citing the calculations done by the Stockholm Environmental Institute, saying these numbers means that it implies that developing countries would have to cut their emissions overall by 20% in absolute terms. Actually, for many of them, they started very low. And, uh, for many countries, many developing countries, which still have a fairly high population growth, China not included, that means they will have at least 60% in per capita cut. So also it means by 2050, developed countries will continue to have a much higher per capita emission allowance two to three times compared to what's allowed for developing countries. So there are different calculations based on different, slightly different assumptions, but uh, the, the range is the same. It's about two to three times more per capita emissions allowed for developed countries compared to developing countries. That's what the real, why the, these numbers mean. That's why China and India rejected these numbers because they really don't want to be locked in to this unfair allowance of emission space. Because it's just a fundamentally an equity issue. Even not Nicholas Stern, the lead author of the famous Stern report coming out of UK, he admits that in terms of the contents of atmosphere, it's, it's hard to think of any arguments as to why rich people should have more of their, this shared resource than the poor people. But unfortunately, the proposal by the Western countries during Copenhagen is a it exactly means they will continue to occupy more carbon space. So that's why during Copenhagen negotiations, China and the G77 as a whole group insisted that uh, yes, we do need a long-term goal for the global carbon emission cut, but a must step for the 50% global goal for 2050 is for Annex 1 countries to reduce at least 40% by year 2020. They insisted this is really a test whether the West is serious about the long-term goal or it's just a lumber game. <laughs> 
but uh, unfortunately, the pledges putting out by the Annex 1 countries is far below that. It's uh, been calculated, uh, the pledges for 2020 is about 20 to eight, 12 to 18 percent below 1990 levels. And if you're including all the loopholes, including AAUs, LULUCF, meaning land use and land use change, and all non-additional CDMs and all other loopholes, it's, it may turn the, Alex, well, the developed countries' pledges into emission growth for year 2020. And another common narrative in the international climate politics is the so-called U.S. and China impasse. This is a, this deadlock between the U.S. and China is one of the big reasons why we cannot reach agreement. So first, I want to show you some comparison between the U.S. and China to say why it's unfair to really put an evil level of burden on the two countries. In terms of per capita GDP, China is about one-eighth of the China's, of the U.S. GDP. And in terms of emissions per capita, China is about a quarter of the U.S. And uh, when we look at uh, cumulative emissions as a percentage of the global emissions, that really shows how much responsibility a country has, meaning how much they have really contributed to the problem of global warming. China, as a, with its about 20% of the world population, contributed less than 9%, while U.S., with less than 5% of the world population, contributed 29%. Uh, so that's a, there's a huge difference of responsibility when you're really looking at a historical responsibility. And as well, as a, China as a developing country has less capability compared to the U.S. Yes, China has enjoyed spectacular growth in the last 20 years. But at the same time, there are still 18% of the rural areas don't have access to clean water. And there's almost about 40% of the rural areas don't have access to improved sanitation. So these are the areas China still need to develop to devote its resources to fulfill these basic human needs. But uh, even though China has less res responsibility and uh, capability, but actually in terms of taking actions to address climate change, China is already doing much more than the U.S. For example, in year 2009, China put in 34.6 billion U.S. dollars investment into clean energy and energy efficiency, which accounts for 0.39% of its GDP. So in terms of uh, percentage of the GDP, it's three times of the U.S. And it's especially interesting when you compare how the two countries allocated their resources in different aspects, for example, military and climate change. So for China, for every dollar spent on climate, about between two and three dollars, is spent on military. While for the U.S., that for in year 2010, for every dollar is spent on climate, 94 dollars are spent on military. While the ratio has improved slightly, that in 2011, for every dollar spent on climate, 41 dollars are spent on military. So that really shows you what the priorities of the U.S. It's not that they don't have resources to address climate change, but they choose to spend on other things like military. And also, according to one calculation coming out of the United Nations Framework on Climate Change Convention Secretary, that the emission reductions in terms of CO2 reduction gigaton according to the country's pledge for 2020, U.S. pledges only end up to 0.8 gigaton reduction, while China's pledge end up to 2.5 gigaton reduction. Uh, another very common missing 
information about uh, China's uh, pledged target of reducing its carbon emission intensity by 40 to 45 percent by year 2020 is that it's portrayed as business as usual. So during Copenhagen, during and after Copenhagen, many critics say that based on China's carbon intensity data, its reduction during the last few years, China don't need to do much to reduce its carbon emission. You just, they just need to continue business as usual to reach their target. But uh, when you really just look, take a little bit back to look at how the carbon intensity has evolved in the last decades, that really shows that's not the, the story. Because actually at the turn of the century, between year 2002 and uh, 2005, China's carbon emission grows very fast. Not only the total amount of carbon emissions, even carbon emission intensity grows. That means the carbon emissions grows even faster than the GDP. So that really alerted the Chinese government. They, that's why they put in lots of very aggressive policies trying to avert that. That's, uh, because of that, we have seen carbon intensity reduction since year 2005 and 2006. So this, this reduction is not because of business as usual, it's because of very hard efforts. And to categorize that as business as usual is really to penalize the early movers to address climate change. So what happened in 2005 is that uh, because of this problem with too rapid increase of energy use, the Chinese government in their 11th five-year plan, which is for year 2006 and 2010, initiated a very ambitious energy efficiency and renewable energy target. So the target is to reduce the national energy intensity by 20% in five years, as well as to raise the proportion of non-fossil fuel energy in primary energy supply by up to 10% by year 2010 and 15% by year 2020. So next I will talk about some of the measures they have take, taken. For example, they, there has been massive close down of small inefficient thermal power plants. So it's widely reported, yes, that China is building lots of new coal-fired plants. Yes, that's true, but at the same time, China actually have been taking a lot of small inefficient thermal power plants offline as well. So between 2006 and 2009, a total of 54 gigawatts of generating capacity has been closed. So from uh, energy efficiency and uh, economical point of view, it's uh, really a uh, no-hanging fruits, and essentially every country who's still do doing, who's still using coal really should do that. They should, if you are, they are having coal-fired power plants, at least they should have a more efficient ones, and it really pays off economically. So it's estimated that the, with the better energy efficiency and the amount of coal saved, the cost recovery is at most uh, 4.5 years but it's not without pain. So with that amount of small plants being closed, it's a, for China as a whole, it's about 400,000 jobs were lost, were eliminated. So the state-owned owned enterprises had to step in to help train at least 260,000 people to retrain them to help them to find employment again. So another big progress China has seen in the last five years is the massive growth of renewable energy, especially wind. So for the last five years, it has been continuously double every year. So in 2005, China set its two wind power goals, five gigawatt by 2010 and 30 gigawatt by 2020, but it has consistently outperformed them. So the 2020 goal of 30 gigawatt has already been surpassed. So in 2010, more than 42 gigawatt total wind capacity were installed, the highest in the world. 
So one reason of this massive growth of wind is really the policies to encourage technology domestication. And that really pays off that wind energy used to be very expensive for China, partly because most of the technical elements and has to be imported. So in 2006, Chinese government introduced a new bidding process which encourage technology domestication. And so turbines with domestic content over 70% can apply for a certain subsidy, but it doesn't mean, it's, it's not a permanent uh, subsidy for domestic producers. That wouldn't be fair. So it's only meant for them to overcome the initial entry barrier. So for each producer, only a maximum of 50 set can enjoy this subsidy. So when you're really looking at the cost of the wind, this has really been effective. But unfortunately, this policy was scrapped in July 2011, last year, under the US pressure, as the US government filed a WTO case against China claiming relevant policies were incomparable with WTO rules. And the NATO will say all this actually produce very bad politics within China. So for the Chinese public, their perception is China is being blamed no matter what. It's being blamed for not put, putting up even higher target, for not making even more compromises during the climate negotiation. But at the same time, its big efforts to develop renewables are also being blamed. So next, I'm going to talk about, yeah, is China doing enough? As I already pre present you with energy, as a developing country, China is already doing much more than the US. And some analysts say, actually, China's goal is within nine with the international energy agency's scenario suggests would be necessary for China, for the world, to keep to total emissions within 400. 50 ppm, but at the same time, there are some studies that say it's not enough. Uh, but I would going to say is to really to step back from the narrow focus of carbon emissions, but really to talk about the environmental challenge as a whole. Because uh, when we're looking at uh, the whole sustainability issue, the greenhouse gas emissions and the global warming is just one aspect of the ecological crisis the whole world, including China, is facing. And uh, we are hitting the limit of the resources. When you take, for example, when you calculate the ecological footprints of different countries, you you can find it's simply impossible for every one of us to have an American lifestyle. For example, it's for the whole world, for every one of us to have an American lifestyle with current American technology, we need about five planets. And even for China, we need 1.1 1 .1 Earth. Just for every Chinese to achieve American lifestyle, needless to say, that's impossible. And uh, so also, Currently, more than 50% of China's oil and 20% of gas consumption also de already depends on import. And uh, China become a even net importer of coal two years ago as well. And uh, it's calculated the known coal reserve will be exhausted in 41 years with the current level of consumption. So it's not very far in the future even though we are continuing to find some new coal, but it's, when you're really looking at the picture, it's, it's not very optimistic. That's why Zhou Da Di, the former director of Energy Research Institute of the Chinese government, who continued to be a very important advisor to the Chinese government on energy issues, said high carbon development will kill itself. He really means it literally. And uh, when you're looking at uh, uh, agriculture, China is especially facing a huge challenge down the road because it only has 9% of the arable, world arable land but has to feed 
20% of the world population. Right now, it's still more than 95% self-sufficient with major grains, but it uses about one-third of the world chemical fertilizers to achieve that. Needless to say, there's a huge environmental liability for that, and it's not sustainable. And on top of that, climate change is already an existing and growing threat to agriculture. So this graph shows the areas which are negatively impacted by climate change, including droughts and floods. So the top area, top line shows areas has at least 10% yield reduction due to floods and droughts, while the lower part shows areas with 30% reduction. So as we can see, in the last half century, it has been fluctuating, but it has uh, upward, very clear upward trend. So it's estimated that the crop losses due to drought and floods add up to 2% of the GDP between year 88 to 2004. And in the last few years, we are having more and more extreme weather conditions. And the Chinese government are very they know all these facts perfectly, and they are taking actions. That's why in 2011, the government announced the plan to invest 4 trillion yuan, which is more than $600 billion into irrigation and rural water works within the next decade. They certainly understand that uh, this is uh, what they need to do in order to ensure food security. When we look at food security globally, we are really facing a big challenge. So this is a map released by, World, by United Nations World Food Program during the Cancun negotiations. So this is the food insecurity index. Uh, so they calculated the, the probability of the countries to face food insecurity due to climate change in the near future. So the darker the color, the greater the danger. So as we can see, countries like uh, Australia is very lucky. You have a very low probability, which is uh, the lowest rank. And countries and like India and many African countries face a very serious challenge. Their rank is very high. China is only slightly better than India. It's high. Its probability to, face, to have food insecurity due to climate change. So within China, we are, we are having competing thoughts, both within the public, with the academia, as well as with the government. So the Chinese government is just like any government. It's not a uniform block. It really have different views and uh, oftentimes have very heated internal debate. So for many people who are working on the technical side, for example, technocrats working on food security issues, working on energy security issues, they say that the limit and constraint on growth is physical and uh, biological. There's simply no way to negotiate with that. Thus, it's really urgent that we change the growth paradigm. And as many of them say, so the constraint posed by international regime can be considered if it's fair and science-based. Also, it's the thinking like this really underpins China's position during Copenhagen. That's why China put its pledges during Copenhagen and Cancun as unilateral and unconditional. It's, it's because many of these technocrats have argued these are things we absolutely need to do for our own sustainability, no matter what happens with the international negotiations. So right now, some scholars are even proposing to put an absolute carbon cap on um, certain rich countries starting from right now and uh, a long-term cap for the whole country. So that's one school of thoughts with, with many technocrats who were really working on these issues of food security and energy security. But uh, unfortunately, we also have many people from international politics, geopolitics of view, many of them 
say that uh, we really shouldn't accept any constraints on growth, especially as climate change is not a real threat. It's mostly a Western conspiracy to constrain the growth of developing countries like China. But unfortunately, this latest growth source has been really strengthened during and after Copenhagen. That's really the sad consequence of the China bashing game. Uh, after Copenhagen, people like Mark Linus and Ed Miniband, the UK the climate uh, minister, has probably pushed more Chinese to become climate skeptics than all the Western skeptics combined because they were really loud and effective in terms of their China blaming game. And uh, so, I've, since then, I've heard more and more people say China really should has been, its policy has been dictated by those technocrats who know nothing about uh, international politics, but they were wrong. For example, during Copenhagen, they should have put its targets as conditional, as the EU did. So it's really a sad turn of the events. So because before Copenhagen, many questions I've when I talk to many of these technocrats, they, their question is, how can international negotiation facilitate more domestic action? But uh, after that, uh, this, they really f feel like they have been undermined by whole international politics. So they say, we, can, we should not talk about no carbon anymore because it has become poisonous, which is true. Actually, in Baidu, Baike, Chinese version of Wikipedia, we even have an entry called the No Carbon Plot with reference to published articles and books about the so-called no, no Carbon Plot, the Western conspiracy to use climate change to constrain China. So now the challenge for many technocrats is like they have given up hope that the international politics can help them to push further for push more, more domestic actions. Instead, it's how can we build a firewall to prevent international climate politics from doing further damage. So, uh, but unfortunately, the West is largely ignorant about all the internal dynamics within China. For example, after Copenhagen, the one Reuters report about EU assessment. So they say officials acknowledge privately that the mandatory system for enforcing emission curbs created by the Kyoto Protocol is doomed because China won't accept any constraints on its future economic growth and the United States won't join any agreement that is not binding on Beijing. So for China, I think it's a very dangerously wrong assessment because it's a self-fulfilling pro prophecy because China's goodwill to put its 2020 targets as unconditional is not being really being appreciated, it's good faith to build the trust. It's just uh, so all the people who are pushing for this are being undermined by all this, this wrong assessment. Uh, So when we look at China, I think it's really, at the same time, it's a microcosm of the world. So it's, uh, internally, it also uh, exhibits all many of the conflicts we see as a world. So firstly, even with the convergence of cumulative per capita emissions, which is the approach advocated by many Chinese scholars working on carbon equity, China will still use up its carbon budget between 2040 and uh, 2050. So that means it's like uh, even, even from the equity point of view, which China is arguing all the time, China still needs to put much more hard work to achieve sustainability, to do its fair share to address the climate change. And also within China, we have alarming polarization of the rich and the poor. And the Gini coefficient, which is a measure of inequality, is uh, the same level as the US, United States and some Latin American countries. And uh, so the per capita G GDP ratio of the richest and poorest provinces is more than 8 to 1. It's roughly similar to the US and China. So actually, within China, we also have a very 
have the issue of common but differentiated responsibility because the rich regions should show their more responsibility compared to the poor regions. That's within the allocation of the targets within the provinces. That's exactly what Chinese officials are trying to do, but this negotiation is also very hard. So Su Wei, China's head negotiator, admits that he also faced very tough negotiations at home with the province head trying to distribute the national target. And uh, some Chinese, one senior Chinese ex expert told, once told me we really need to address this equity issue because no matter how much ecological space we still have, if we don't change the current growth model, the rich cities will continue to use up most of it, leaving little space for the rural areas to develop. And unfortunately, it's really a mirror image of the global situation. It's like currently it's countries like US that continue to use up their unfair big share of the very limited remaining carbon space, leaving very little space for the developing countries to develop. So at the same time, while the West is saying China needs to do more to address climate change, but at the same time, they also is forcing the South to repeat its mistakes, especially by selling their automobile-oriented lifestyle. So Gao Feng, China's head negotiator in two, during 2000 and 2005, recounted the story. He said once, he remarked to a senior German official that if the Chinese wanted to combat climate change, then Germany's car manufacturers could go home and the Chinese could return to their bicycles. That would be very low carbon and green. But the German official became quite agitated and answered, that won't do. The Chinese should keep buying cars but only drive them once a week. <laughs> So unfortunately, so for the last decades, China really sees the explosion of the car, private car ownership and they are not driving it once a week. And uh, so just uh, two years ago, China overtook the US as uh, the world number one automobile consumer. And also, in terms of public policy, the, the increasing car ownership, the mid uh, the emerging middle class are having more say, but unfortunately, it's not necessarily for the better of the environment. For example, in, at, between the year 2007 and 2008, the Chinese government planned to institute a fairly high fuel tax like Japan and the EU to disencourage the rapid increase of automobile and oil consumption, but unfortunately that effort was successfully beaten back by the car owners. They, success they voiced their opposition and the government caved in. And uh, oftentimes messages from Western politicians does not help. So for example, in last year, when President Obama was giving an interview with Australia Broadcasting Commission, he said, if over a billion Chinese citizens have the same living patterns as the Australians and Americans do right now, then all of us are in for a very miserable time. The planet just cannot sustain it which is absolutely true. This is a message I always talk to my Chinese audiences whenever I talk to them about these issues. But it's not helpful for people like Obama to say that without ever referring to the need for the US Americans and Australians to change their current way of life. So this interview of Obama was widely reported in China, but unfortunately, the most typical response by the average Chinese is, why should we Chinese conserve resources so you, you, the US Americans and Australians can continue their way? So I want to come down to a little bit more positive note. 
So in 2010, right before the Cancun negotiation, has Joseph Seller, has Joseph Fell, a very prominent German Green, the spokesman on energy for the German Greens Parliament Group. When he was asked about his expectation about Cancun, he answered, I don't have much hope for Cancun. Then he ended, yet I have great hope for China because China has the world's biggest reforestation project and the fastest growing renewable sector. We can all learn something from China. It was very comforting to hear such a view from a senior politician based on facts after all the China bashing. But uh, for me, actually, I have more mixed feelings. On the one hand, I do have some hope. Yes, it's true that uh, China is taking lots of action in terms of like reforestation and renewable energy, partly because China's leadership do take science very seriously. When you look at the makeup of the Chinese top leadership, like between 80 to 90 of them, 90% of them have uh, science and technology background. That's why they do take science much more seriously, I think, compared to the United States, which are being run by lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so that's why they are really going full gear on energy efficiency and renewables. But on the same hand, I think these are very important first steps, which some Western nations really need to step up their efforts to address that. But I think at the same time, these technology solutions probably won't be sufficient. And the consumption and lifestyle change is necessary as well. And for the Chinese public at large, it's really, they really need to realize the emulation of the US lifestyle is a dead end. But unfortunately, the hope of opening up discussion on this aspect really has been dampened by the international climate politics since Copenhagen. So as I said, many technocrats who are working on energy issues and agriculture issues feel that we really need to do more domestically, no matter what happens with the international negotiations. But for the public at large, their gut response, their opinion is China should do what the West does, not what the West says China should do, which they are not doing themselves. So I think that's really the challenge for all of us, especially you, because the Taking the U.S. is obviously a bad example, but even when we're looking at the Australia, I was told by an Australia colleague that even with the much debated carbon tax, which I hope it will, won't be scrapped, Australia's carbon emissions won't peak until year 2023. That's not a good example if we want to ask developing countries to step up their efforts. Thank you. Dr. Wen, thank you very much. I think that's the first time I've ever heard China described as a microcosm of the world. It's a very big microcosm. <laughs> but uh, Dr. Wen, that was a very eloquent reminder of just how important China is on this as it is on so many other questions. And now, without further ado, I might go to the panel uh, for their immediate thoughts on uh, what we've just heard. Uh, first of all, uh, Do Dr. Meinshausen, if you could uh, come forward, please. And I wonder if I could ask you, on the basis of your personal experiences uh, in dealing with the climate change negotiations, which I know you have been involved in discussions with uh, Chinese negotiators as well, just how what uh, Dr. Wen has said about Chinese attitudes and the Chinese sense that they've got a bad rap uh, in terms of what uh, emerged or did not from Copenhagen and subsequently just how accurate or otherwise that is from uh, your perspective. Thank you very much. Dr. Uh, Dr. Meinshausen, here you are. 
Thank you very much. Uh, Honour to be here. Uh, I'm not quite sure what to say. Um, it is a very true reflection of what you see in international climate negotiations. Um, we often hear the phrase, you're not entitled to your to, you are entitled to your own opinion, but you're not entitled to your own facts. But unfortunately, everybody's entitled to its own fact, selection of facts. Um, in all these numbers, I basically agree to all of them, except one, and I will come back to that uh, in a second. Um, but just to add two further numbers, and I'm not claiming here to speak from a European perspective, but last year, 2011, 29% of global emissions come from China, fossil and industrial CO2 emissions, 29%. The next highest emitter is, as we all know, the US, but only with 16%. Last year, China's per capita emissions were 7.2 tons per, ca per capita. European emissions were 7.5, fossil and industrial CO2 emissions. These are other facts that uh, resonate rather well <laughs> and rather loudly with, for example, European politicians um, and the European public who say, well, if there's a third of world's emissions with a population of one billion that have the same, basically the same per capita emissions as we have, um, the world has changed dramatically over the last 10 years, and we have to look into a new regime where everybody in one way or the other is on board. It's a completely different game for India, but for China, with the high growth over the last couple of years, um, we really need to look at ways how we jointly achieve that um, yeah, strategic problem that um, is, from many psychological viewpoints, so uh, badly posed for us humans to act with because of the long inertias. Um, I come back now to that one number that you mentioned which surprised me that when the Chinese said, well, we can't accept the globally halved emissions by 2050 because there's an implication as well, and that number has been on the table, at least 80% reductions by Annex 1 countries, that that would imply two to three times higher per capita emissions of the developed world. I'm not sure whether I understood that number correctly, but if that was the reason why China um, uh, vetoed that number, then that is really sad, because that number is not right. 85% reduction by Annex 1 countries would be roughly an equal per capita in 2050. Whether that is fair to converge to equal per capita in 2050, that is another question. But if the Chinese thinking was that 80% or uh, this 80 to 95% range was on the table, um, implies that the per capita emissions by 2050 are still two to three times higher, then that is really sad. And having been 10 years of the negotiations, I must say, um, over the last couple of times, you can turn in a, into a really depressed mode at the negotiations because everybody has a lot of facts, a lot of reasons why we act a lot and the other stone. And similarly, I don't say that European is ahead. European is, Europe is not the leader anymore in the international climate regime either. The US never was. The US could be, um, China could be, but unfortunately, if the question of the evening is whether China is leading the fight on climate change, then unfortunately not. It's not China, it's not the EU, it's not the US. At the moment, it is, if anything, little tiny states, small island states, Maldives, Costa Rica, who have a carbon neutrality target, etc. So unfortunately, the world has lost the leaders on climate change. And Europe is in a difficult position because of the new member states and very different viewpoints about the debt crisis, but every other big industrialized nation finds national circumstances why they are currently in a difficult position, etc. Now, where, where does the solution lie? We, we briefly discussed before, what are the conditions for the international um, negotiations actually moving forward? What has to happen? And at the currently, we are um, kind of at a roadblock. Um, unfortunately, I think we have um, to wait for 
a change in the mentality of the public, of the negotiators, where we really see the urgency of the problem, where we think, hey, we have to address that jointly. Maybe there's first a phase where every country has to look individually, well, we do climate mitigation for our own benefit because we are more energy security, but as well for China, for example, if China, if it's in the hands of China to avoid a third of additional climate change in the future, then that avoided third might be an incentive for China to do climate mitigation simply because of the avoided impacts in China. Um, anyway, top, the top six emitters of the world, the top six countries, including the EU27, they emit 70%. The top 25 emit 80 percent, um, and there are other forums internationally out there where these countries come together, but um, what has to happen for us to move forward into an international climate regime, I unfortunately don't have the answer. I hope my next speaker, the next speaker here does. <laughs> Walter, well, thank you very much indeed. And yes, next up, uh, John Daly. And John, I'm just, uh, with that pessimistic uh, uh, peroration from uh, both of our previous uh, speakers, I wonder if I could ask you, yes, what has to happen? Uh, we heard from Dr. Wen that China will do what the West does, not what the West says. What then are uh, necessary and sufficient conditions for some momentum as far as climate change negotiations after what is coming close to uh, a decade now of uh, rather depressing stasis. John Daly. Thank you very much and, and thank you Dr Wen and Mark. Thank you for your thoughts and thank you all for being here this evening. Um, I'd like to answer that or try and get struggle towards the development of a plan for an answer um, to that question about how do we move forward from here. By outlining three different ways that we solve collective action problems. Because make no doubt, no question about it, this is a collective action problem. Uh, global emissions are global. Uh, and the only way that this is going to change is if a number of countries, a number of large countries, particularly China and the US, uh, change their behaviour quite substantially. There's no other alternative. So under what situations might that happen? Well, one way that we solve collective action problems is, is through a collective agreement. Another way is through uh, essentially spontaneous cooperation. And a third way is because we decide to do it out of our self-interest. I want to go through and talk about which of those is in fact most plausible. So firstly, sometimes we solve collective action problems through a collective agreement. We come together, we all agree that there's a problem, we all agree how it's going to be divvied up, uh, and that's the agreement. Uh, it's been obviously the dominant mode of thinking for uh, the global climate negotiations for the last 20 years, uh, and has been um, labelled the treaties, targets and trading view of the world. And it would be fair to say, I think with enormous respect to the two speakers we've heard already, it ain't doing that well right at the moment. <laughs> uh, and I suspect it's going to be very difficult for it to get better. Because let's think about what has to happen for that kind of collective agreement to, to um, come to pass. Essentially, a group of countries have to come together and agree amongst each other about how a whole pile of economic pain is going to be shared between them. Inherently, that's a really hard thing to do. If you think about the enormous success that the Australian states have as they uh, attack that kind of problem, you'll understand why it's a little harder when you have several hundred countries at the table, uh, particularly when they have very different political systems and views of the world. Secondly, um, countries will need to agree to monitoring systems because the only way that any of this is going to work 
uh, is if countries have a genuine belief that they're all doing what they said they're doing and not cheating. And that means that countries such as the United States and China are both going to need to agree to some kind of halfway verifiable monitoring system about their emissions. And obviously, that's going to be quite a big ask as well. Uh, and finally, certainly the way the negotiations have been going, uh, the developed countries are going to need to agree to transfer a large amount of money uh, and intellectual property to developing countries, despite the fact that most of the world's developed countries right at the moment have a series of economic problems that are not going to go away in a hurry. And indeed, the few countries in the world at the moment that do seem to have surplus cash, at least in their government's bank accounts, are in fact primarily developing countries. So that suggests to me there's at least three things that suggest that uh, if we continue down the treaties, trading uh, and targets route, uh, we could all be back here in 15 years' time hearing basically much the same kind of thing. So the second way that we solve collection, collective item action problems is through cooperation. Uh, and a, a woman called Eleanor Ostrom won a Nobel Prize for pointing out that uh, although lawyers, and I'm a lapsed lawyer, uh, tend to assume that we will solve collective action problems through these kind of collective agreements, actually when you get out of the real world and you look at the, what happens, often collective action problems are solved by people more or less knowing what they should do. And that's not entirely true of carbon um, emissions. Many people in the world don't believe there's a problem, but a substantial number do. And seeing each other doing something about it and then coming to the conclusion that they will do more or less what they see others doing. And you can sometimes see a sort of ratchet effect as you move up like this. And some places in the world have solved problems around uh, fisheries, around forest use uh, and so on, using these kinds of techniques. But it would be fair to say that this too is pretty difficult. Um, you need to draw a distinction between effort and impact, and in climate emissions, sorry, in carbon emissions, that's a particular problem. It is possible to spend a lot of money and put a lot of effort into doing things that are supposed to reduce emissions and actually not reduce them by very much. So, for example, if you wanted to reduce Australian emissions efficiently, Chances are you would do that by things like um, changing how much uh, fly ash we put into concrete and other such exciting changes. If, on the other hand, you wanted to do it in a way that was very visible, you would probably do it by putting solar panels on roofs, which at least historically has been incredibly expensive in the order of three to $400 per tonne of CO2 averted. So those are the choices. Um, you can either look at, at actual actions and effort, or you can look at actual actions and outcomes, and of course the outcomes are much harder to measure. And then there's a third way, as I suggested, to solve collective action, item, uh, collective action problems, and that's unbridled self-interest. And indeed, if you look around the world at what countries are actually making substantial shifts uh, in their um, carbon emissions, by and large, I regret to say, or indeed I'm encouraged to say, it's been about enlightened self-interest, often for reasons that don't have a huge amount to do with carbon emissions. Yes, we have seen European emissions drop very substantially. Partly that's because the economy uh, suffered a bit of a hiccup, uh, and partly um, because uh, Europe wound up with a substantial energy security problem. Um, many countries in Europe are very short of fossil fuels. Many of them, at least, have been in the past quite reliant on Russian gas and, and gas from the Soviet Union, old Soviet Union countries more generally. Uh, they've had a series of incidents in which it became very obvious that sometimes those pipes might get turned off. Their governments weren't real keen on that as an option uh, and consequently have been moving to see what they could do to essentially provide energy in ways that didn't rely on fossil fuels, uh, essentially around fuel security and energy security, uh, as opposed to uh, a real focus on carbon emissions per se. And the other thing that I would suggest is very encouraging at the moment is that although carbon uh, solar PV panels might have been very expensive in the past, they're a great deal cheaper today. A recent report by McKinsey and Company pointed out that there are a substantial number of situations in the world already in which it is cheaper to provide electricity through solar PV panels than it is through conventional fossil fuel type electricity. 
and it is likely that the number of situations in which that is true will increase very rapidly. The cost of solar PV uh, globally has halved in the last five years. Uh, and it's a pretty straight line if you look at it at the history. Uh, so there's at least a reasonable chance that one of the reasons that we may start to see substantial reductions in emissions globally is because people decide it's actually just cheaper to produce their power through renewables and certainly more secure than some of the other options they have. So on this one, I suspect that both internationally and domestically, I'm with Paul Keating. Always back the horse called self-interest, at least you know it's trying. <laughs> That does, though, lead to the question, OK, so what should governments do that make that the most likely outcome? And this is where um, we can look at renewables policy, and this is something where clearly China has played a major role over the last few years in terms of supporting the deployment of renewables, supporting the producers of renewable um, electricity in particular, and that has had the impact of substantially reducing the price and cost of renewables over the last decade. And I would suggest that is indeed the most important thing we need to do. It's not just about research and development. A large chunk of the cost of renewables today is actually about really boring stuff, like exactly how many welds do you need to create a frame for a solar panel and in which order and how, many do you, how do you put them up and all of those kinds of things. So you do need to be encouraging deployment. The question, of course, is how much deployment do you need in order to continue that rapid decline down the cost curve? Uh, and that's a question on which I suspect rather more work needs to be done. It's not obvious that you need to deploy at enormous scale. You do need to deploy at some scale to push us down that cost curve. And then, of course, you also need things that at least start us down this reduction in, renewal, in uh, emissions. And, of course, that's the virtue of a broad-based carbon price, that it gets you thinking about the stuff which is perhaps rather less exciting than solar panels, but rather more important, or more to the point, much cheaper, boring things like how do we make cement and out of what do we make it. So I'd suggest we've got three ways forwards as a globe around this. We can either have a top-down treaty. I'd love to believe that was true, but I suspect it's not going to happen anytime soon. We can have cooperative action, and that's possible, but hard. Or we can see enlightened self-interest as we see the price of these things falling. And it suggests, therefore, the most important thing that you can do, if you want to be the, the Olympic gold winner uh, of the carbon, uh, carbon emissions uh, event, uh, then the trick is to ask, what is the government doing in order to push us down that curve as fast as we can be, both with the important general things around uh, um, renewables, uh, in particularly in terms of electricity, and around those more general boring things like concrete uh, that are, in the end, also going to be extremely important. Uh, I don't want to um, award a medal this evening, but hopefully that at least gives us some idea of the challenges, very real challenges we face as a globe, the options that we have, none of them wildly encouraging, and at least some kind of indication about what it is that governments need to do to make progress. Thank you. Very glad we finally got back to cement. Uh, <laughs> may not be glamorous, but it is essential. Um, Kirsty Albion, uh, I just wonder if I could ask you, we've, we've looked at uh, various perspectives here, but, and I should add, in a moment you will get a chance to ask some questions yourselves, uh, but Australia's responsibility in all this, what can Australia do to bring about, to help bring about global change, because it's quite clear, whatever other disagreement there may be, that without global change in one way or another, uh, this problem simply will not be fixed. Sure. Kirsty Albion. Thanks. That's right. I think I'm a bit small. Um, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Great. Um, so my name's Kirsty. Um, before I answer that question, I just wanted to remind us all why we're here by telling you my story. So my name's Kirsty. 
Um, and I'm from the Australian Youth Climate Coalition. I see some friendly faces from there tonight. Um, the Australian Youth Climate Coalition is one of Australia's largest youth-run organisations. Our mission is to build a generation-wide movement to solve the climate crisis before it's too late. The reason I joined the AYCC is because I grew up in Tasmania. And Tasmania, if you've been there, is one of the most beautiful places on Earth. Um, I grew up on the land in Tassie, and from a young age, I realised that climate change isn't just about raising temperatures and rising sea levels. But climate change means just that, a fundamental change in our climate. That as we continue to pollute, we're actually changing our climate. We're changing the temperature, we're changing where the rain falls. And this means huge changes in where species can live and where we can grow our food. It increases extreme weather events like bushfires and floods. And so that's why I came to climate change from an environmental perspective. But when I joined the AYCC, I realised that young people come to this issue for many reasons, because of justice, because of development, but most of all because it's our future. As young people, we can see very clearly we stand at a crossroads today, that we have two choices. We can create a world where we continue to pollute and irreversibly change our climate. For young people, that means an 8% drop in GDP. It means a lot of young people will never get a job. It means billions of people will wa won't have access to food and water. It means millions of people will lose access to their homes. Or we have another choice, and that is a choice where we do what is necessary and avoid the worst impacts of climate change. The science tells us that in order to do that, we need to peak emissions globally by 2015. And that to avoid a dangerous runaway climate change, we have a carbon budget. So when I answer the question of what is Australia's responsibility, the, what I think is not about waiting for China to move. It's not about who should do what first. It should be how can Australia ensure that globally we don't go over our carbon budget? Because that's what is going to ensure the safety of our future for our generation. So I think we can all sit here and see that Australia's done some great things on climate and some bad things globally. Similarly, China's done some great things for the climate and some bad things globally. But the question is, what is Australia going to do? And as the biggest polluter per person in the de high developed world, I think our responsibility is to lead. Australia cannot sit any longer and wait for other countries to move. We need to move first. And so what that looks like is massively reducing our emissions. We are the sunniest country in the world. Our a report was released today that said we could power all of the globe's energy needs 50 times over with our sun resources. Globally, investment in renewables exceeded investment in fossil fuels last year. But we're not seeing that in Australia. Australia is still massively expanding our fossil fuel industry. So the first thing Australia needs to do is to change. We need to shift our investment, not from fossil fuels and into renewable energy. And we need to lead the way because we will never see other countries moving until Australia does. The second thing we need to do is to recognise that China's emissions are not just China's emissions, they're Australia's emissions. We are planning 120 new coal mines in Australia and we're going to export that fossil fuels overseas. And a lot of that is going to end up in China. Australia has a responsibility to stop subsidising our fossil fuel industry and our coal export industry and to start investing in renewable energy so that we can provide and become an exporter of cheap renewable energy. And when I talked about that carbon budget, we have coal mines in Australia that are being planned that will be shipped out of the Great Barrier Reef that will um, contribute 7% of the global carbon budget. This is atrocious. If Australia wants to talk about what our responsibility is, our responsibility is to lead. And for our future, that means we need to shift away from fossil fuels and exporting fossil fuels and become a leader in renewable energy. Um, so that's what my answer is. Thank you. Kirsty, John, Malta and uh, Dr Wendt, thank you all very much. It is time now for some questions uh, from the floor. Uh, we have a couple of microphones here. Um, it's quite obviously a, some are very keen up here. And if you could uh, please uh, tell us if you 
have a particular member of the panel that you wish to ask the question of, if you could direct it to them, otherwise we'll have to make uh, a choice. No, Away we general, go, thank you. Sort of a general statement. Um, my name's Ian Light, and um, I agree with Kirsty about this solar energy problem. Now, if we look at Israel, which was not mentioned uh, as a country that's trying to develop renewable energy and has had a lot of input into solar energy and also they've got the electric cars and desalination. But if you look at Israel, Israel is a country, very small country. The Negev, which is desert, is 12,000 square kilometres. Australia's desert area is 1.3 billion square kilometres. So that's 100,000 times the size of Israel. And uh, they're producing their solar energy. They're hoping to, I don't know, I, I don't know what the scientists say, but certainly in terms of solar energy, Australia can, and the rest of the world where they've got deserts, can sort of um, look at this uh, solar energy, look at electric cars, uh, look at desalination. I think all these things are important. And the other thing when we talk about food and water deprivation is we've got to really look at sharing, at food rationing, at water rationing. In other words, uh, just like in war, they had rations. They had rations in Britain. They had rations in Russia. The ration for a, a Soviet soldier in Stalingrad was three glasses of vodka. And um, I think we've got to look at, you know, in terms of Africa and America and things like this, if things do get out of hand, we have to look at rationing jobs. Now, in Spain, they've got 50% unemployment. Why there is not job sharing, it's a mystery to me. I don't understand. It, it, it probably is a mystery. Look, I know whether we, we've got a anyway, little time. What I'm take... saying is, what, what, what yeah. I'm saying, what I'd like to, sorry, what I'd like to say is the big problem is that does solar energy give the profits that the coal mines and the other mineral, the gold and everything else gives? And I think that's probably one of the problems that needs to be addressed. Hey, John, I wonder if you'd like to deal with that, the economics of solar in Australia. Um, short answer is not yet. Uh, at least if, it's, if there is no government support, uh, apart from some relatively specialised situations. So if you're a... If you're a relatively remote community a long way from anywhere uh, in Australia, then actually already we're at the point where uh, solar can be the cheapest way of producing electricity, and that means someone who's producing the panels is, and, and installing it is making a profit, uh, at least in the long run. Uh, in the medium term, um, Australia will only continue to install solar, and indeed people around the world will only continue, continue to install solar if there is some form of government subsidy, although there are much more efficient and much less efficient ways and much more costly and much less costly ways of delivering that subsidy. And we've recently published a piece of work essentially arguing um, that if you want to do it in an efficient way, then you want to structure up particular auctions that are regular and that effectively push you down the, down the cost curve. Um, and that's the short answer is that if we want to go down that cost curve to the point where solar is genuinely competitive and you can make a dollar doing it without government support, um, then we will need government support to get us to that point. Then this is the final point, and I think it's not well appreciated around the world and it's never, almost never, factored into government forecasts. At the point that something like solar or wind actually does become substantially cheaper, significantly cheaper than existing technologies, it will not be a nice, gentle line anymore. It will then be a very rapid takeoff of these technologies. One thing we do know about technology changes, the minute there is a new technology that without government subsidy is substantially cheaper than whatever it is superseding, you don't get some kind of nice, gentle transition from point A to point B. You get a very rapid, often very disruptive transition. That means there are big winners and big losers. A question over on my left, the right over here. Uh, gentlemen, yes, that'd be fine. Wherever you can get to quickly. <laughs> Hi, thanks. Um, my question is mainly for John. Um, I think given what Kirsty said, mentioning the fact that we um, have a very short window of time in order to um, do our best at climate change mitigation and avoid uh, the 
atrocities, which will come with more than two degrees of warming. Um, do you think, John, that there is a, a place for um, potential, potentially more intervention, like say what uh, Germany has done with feed-in tariffs, to encourage um, the the take up of renewable technologies um, at a at a pace which is probably quicker than what what it looks like it's going to be right now. Um, uh, uh, government policy, I'd suggest, in climate space, fundamentally has two objectives at any point in time, and they're actually subtly different, but very importantly, different objectives. One objective is to reduce emissions by as much as possible over the next 12 months. Uh, and if that is your objective, the least cost way to do that, and the way that will have the most impact, is to have a general carbon price. And basically, the, higher, the more reduction you want, the higher you make the price. The other objective of government policy may well be to reduce the cost of those technologies in the future and do so because, and intervene in that direct way over and above a carbon price because either one, no one believes the carbon price going forward, and Australia is a lovely demonstration of you know, that kind of issue at the moment, um, or because there are substantial disincentives to first movers, uh, and that's a huge problem in the climate space because the first deployers of technology basically incur higher costs, but they get paid the same amount for their electricity. Uh, so there's huge incentives for everybody to be a second mover, uh, and that means that no one's a first mover, and that means that nothing happens. And that's the rationale for government intervention over and above a carbon price. But note the reason you're doing it. You are doing it simply to push us down the cost curve as fast as possible. And the implication of that is you probably want to run these things as auctions. You probably want to run them so that there's a series of different auctions uh, in different technologies, because you don't know which technology is going to come down the cost curve fastest over the next 10 years. Yeah. If I had to put money on something right at the moment, I'd probably be putting it on solar PV. But I would be the first to say there is a very good chance I would blow my dough doing that. <laughs> um, you, we don't know which horse is going to run, what, run this race. And then the third feature of that kind of thinking is you only do enough to push us down the cost curve. And there's a certain amount of deployment that you need to do that. And then there's a certain amount of deployment which just basically means that whoever's making the wind turbines or the panels or whatever else basically just makes more money than they would otherwise, but it doesn't necessarily encourage technology development to be any faster. So that's what I would argue is the optimal policy in this space. You want as high a carbon price as you are prepared to wear um, to get as much reduction as you want. And of course, that's as long as a piece of string. And then secondly, you want policy that pushes this stuff down the cost curve over the medium term. I wonder whether we might have a question for Dr. Wen, perhaps, from somebody, please. Uh, just up here in the middle. Yeah, Anthony Payton's my name. Just a question about linking in the, um, the self-interest, but probably focusing on the international um, negotiations and whether or not self-interest has been spoken about in terms of um, natural disasters and um, particularly with China, in terms of whether or not self-interest means you know, floods and droughts and so on, is that's been on the radar in terms of actually making some difference in terms of the Europeans, are they affected by natural disasters as much as China and where that sort of comes into the discussion? So they're still based in self-interest, yeah. but not on the commercial side that John's been talking about. Um. Uh, it's certainly true, actually, for big countries like China and India, actually, it's of their interest uh, to address climate change because, the, actually, according to one German study, Ch both China and India end up within the top 10 countries will be negatively impacted by climate change. But uh, unfortunately, its international politics is, uh, plays very little role because it's not only China, even countries like Pakistan, like we know a few years ago has a devastating floods, which millions of people were negatively impacted and uh, Pakistan as a least developed country uh, are very ill equipped to deal with that. But unfortunately in this strange world of climate politics, people are really being affected People, countries like even Pakistan has very little say. It's just a few countries kind of head-picked by 
Western powers to be representative, to be climate victims, actually it's very unfair, I would say. <laughs> Another question, maybe, got a microphone just up the back there, I think, on, perfect. Thank you. Um, we've heard a little bit about some of the emissions reductions um, technologies and, and, and what's available, what's happening in, uh, in China. Uh, a lot of the, the world's manufacturing is done in China and a lot of emissions come from the manufacturing center, sector. In fact, if you look at the IEA um, blue map um, scenarios, they talk about a range of technologies you need to do. You need to move towards renewables, you need to reduce um, and improve energy, energy efficiency, and you need to reduce emissions by carbon capture and storage, both for the energy sector and for the manufacturing sector. Um, as I run a, a research funding agency, I get to sit on a few government panels looking at what governments are doing in the, uh, the low emissions area and I've yet to see anything significant either from Australia or from China or Japan on reducing emissions from the manufacturing sector. Um, can you comment on that? Dr. Wen? Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, the government has have uh, the major focus is, uh, one major focus is really reducing the uh, carbon emissions by in manufacturing. Actually, for example, in during our 11th five-year plan, 2006-2010, the Chinese government has a private-public uh, partnership program called the 1000 Enterprises, which they identified the 1,000 the biggest enterprises within China actually accounted for 30% of the uh, industrial emissions and all, all these uh, enterprises have to have a carbon reduction plan. So that's what happened during the last five years. So in our current five year plan for year 2011 to year 20. 15, this, uh, this program has expanded to, to uh, from 1,000 enterprises to 10,000 enterprises. So basically the 10,000 biggest enterprises in China all have to have their carbon, first carbon inventories that then have their carbon reduction plans. With the indulgence of the, uh, of the organizers, we are running over. I might just get one more question if I could. Maybe up here, please, and then we had better wrap things up, I think, I'm afraid. Thank you. Um, I'm Fiona, and I just want to make a short but very important statement. It's that um, a lot of people think that China is the most polluting country in the world, but it's actually <laughs> wrong if you see it from another side, because um, China has a high uh, carbon emission as a country uh, last year. And it's mainly because uh, it has three reasons. And the first one is that China is, a, is the world factory. And a lot of you know that <laughs> um, uh, most of the goods are manufactured and imported from China. So, so um, it, it's one of the reasons that makes China's emission high. And the other one is that China um, has a huge population. So if, it, if, it, um, if it's calculated as a country, of course it will be high. But if you see it as, um, if you count it as per capita, but it will be much lower than Australia. And the third one is that China is still developing, but the US, the um, Australia have already developed. <laughs> So, um, yeah, that's all. Thank you. I think we might take that as a comment, but it might be a worthwhile point at which to wrap up, in fact, unless, Dr. Wen, do you want to say something quickly? Yeah. yeah, I think I have a short comment to that, especially on the first point, yes. Uh, well, uh, according to calculations, 23% uh, of China's emissions is for export. So, 
Actually, there's a study coming out of UK last year. Actually, they found that if you really count all the goods consumed in UK coming from China, actually, that that's actually should be UK's carbon footprint. And what they found is that actually UK's carbon emissions has been growing since 1990 instead of shrinking. So essentially, they just outsourced their carbon emissions to China. It's a big issue, not only internationally, but also for China, how to deliver its domestic goals. Because right now, we have higher goals for the more rich regions and lower goals for the poor regions. But so if the rich regions just simply outsource the carbon emissions to poor, to poor regions, as a country, we don't reduce the emissions. So it's both a global and regional issue for China. How do we really more accurately do the accounting and really reduce our emissions instead of just outsourcing them? It was, as they say, ever thus. Thank you very much, Dr. Wen, for a fascinating uh, insight and, and glimpse into Chinese thinking on one of the most crucial issues of the modern age. Also to our other panellists, uh, Malta Meinshausen, uh, John Daly from uh, uh, Grattan Institute and, uh, and Kirsty Albion too. Fine contributions from you all. Thank you all for being here. And before we go, I just ask Julia Gong uh, from the Confucius Institute to wrap up uh, proceedings. Thank you very much. When my colleague um, uh, Julia Fraser opened the session and she said, I hope you could feel warmer after the session. So I just want to ask everybody, do you feel uh, warmer or colder? <laughs> well, from this session, I think we all have uh, a lot to take away and to take away and uh, have a lot to think about. Of course, the government, different countries all uh, you know, need to do what they need to do. But then as Kirsty pointed out, well, we, what can we do? You know, can we travel back to our home on this cold winter Melbourne night? on public transportation, giving up our lifestyle, you know, what can we do? So I think rather than, you know, um, waiting for things to happen, perhaps we can all try to do something, you and me and everybody here. And um, so once again, I would like to uh, thank uh, the panel members for your uh, insights and uh, for your thoughts. And also, uh, especially, I would like to uh, thank Dale for your wonderful presentation presentation and Jim for moderating the session. I think we all have learned a lot. And also I would like to acknowledge the organizers of this special event, AsiaLink, Confucius Institute, the Engagement Division at the University of Melbourne, and Melbourne Energy Institute and Australia's role in the world program. Also, my special thanks to my university colleagues here who have been working very hard to put this event together and also the volunteers for this event tonight. Um, well, this session actually has been recorded. So uh, if you are interested or if your friends are interested, uh, you're welcome to uh, watch the session at the um, um, uh, Australia's Role in the World website. So you can Google their name and you can find their uh, site. Uh, well, I think I'd better to um, uh, wind up and thank you all very much and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. <laughs>